computer. Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is Artist Talk on Art. This is our 54th virtual open studio. Artist Talk on Art, the ATOA has been around since 1975. All our talks have been live up until COVID, up until about a year and three weeks ago. Um, everything on the Lower West Side. Um, our last location and still our current location is 12 West 12th Street. But because of COVID, we moved to Zoom. We meet every Monday. Um, this is the link to come. And in an odd way, there's been a great windfall for us where people come in and listen or present from all over the world. So we've sort of, uh, uh, we, we've taken advantage of some terrible times and we have been a connector. Uh, when we started, we had seven or 17 people. We had a talk with 75 people. And I see we have a nice group coming tonight. We have two presenters. We have Christopher Kazmarek and Patricia Mirandi. They're actually a husband and wife couple, which I find very sweet. And I've always, uh, I once when I had a gallery, I actually had exhibits with spouses presenting. I think it's a beautiful theme. Um, the ATOA is a 501c3. We are a nonprofit. There's no charge for our talks. These talks are being recorded. I will put them up on YouTube. Our YouTube channel and everything about us can be found on our website, which is atoanyc.org. And if you'd like to contribute, you can take a look and you'll see something there as well. Um, keep in mind, we hear everything on Zoom. So when you talk like this into your phone, we, we hear that. So I, I have you on mute. Feel free to unmute at any time, ask a question or make a comment. Just join the dialogue or start the dialogue. Um, we're going to have very sharp presentations. We have PowerPoint presentations. Everybody sort of come up to speed. At the same time, when you ask a question or give a thought, it not only throws the person into another vein of thinking, but it really opens them up to an idea maybe they didn't think to speak about. So as many of the regulars here know, we encourage that. You don't have to ask a question. You can just say something. As well, we have a chat. Uh, function. You, you should see a chat button on the bottom. You can press that. You can put any information in there. You can put links to your website, your Instagram, or you can as well make comments, something you like or want to say, but you prefer to put it in the chat. And what I'll do is I will read that off during the presentations just to sort of uh, make it interactive. I've been to lots of talks at art fairs and I see the speakers on a podium and Everyone's sitting down here and trying to stay awake and wishing they drank coffee. That's not our goal here. Our goal here is somewhat interactive and to feel engaged um, in what we do. Um, again, it's atoanyc.org. I see a lot of familiar faces here. It's very nice to see and also new faces. I do want to point out a board member I see, Fran Kornfeld. Nice to see you. And Fran's coming in from almost the West Coast, right? Will we consider that the West Coast? Let's see, I'm asking it on mute. I, okay, I, I did. <clears throat> no, yeah, we're, we're definitely on the West Coast. Uh, Eugene, Oregon. Yeah, some reason being from New York, I assume only California is the West Coast, right? Everything no, <laughs> two states above it. <laughs> of course yeah. there are. So thanks, Fran, and Fran's been great. I do want to say if you enjoy what you see here, spread the word, tell friends, tell Fred's, tell Fred if you know Fred. Um, we're artists talk on art, and we happen when artists talk on art. And that's what we're going to have tonight. Um, share ideas with your friends. And as well, if you, uh, if you have an idea for a talk, reach out to me. I haven't said no, I don't say no. We're about yeses. Um, that's the kind of organization and that's the kind of group we formed and we've nurtured. You can put together anything you like. My confidence is if you're here, you will make something of value and it hasn't gone wrong. We've had so many different things presented upon. There's a calendar on our website. You can see what's coming. Uh, the first of the month comes this Monday and every Monday, first of the month, Veronica Pena organizes a performance artist to discuss their art. So we are sort of expanding our medias and materials. 
and you'll find we present a wide range. I'm just going to say we have Christopher Kazmarek presenting and Patricia Morandi, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves or actually each other. And Patricia's going to introduce Christopher first. So welcome, Patricia, and welcome, uh, Christopher. I'm going to unmute you both. Such a pleasure to have you speak. And again, like I always say, you know, there are only so many things to say, so I'm very repetitive. Thank you for your time. That is your most valuable commodity. That's the one we all have in limited supply. And just for bringing it here to the table to artists talk on art means a lot. So thank you, Patricia. Well, thank you so much. I, I love all the things you said. <laughs> that there, there are a lot of the, the sort of um, ethos of my, of my world, you know, an artist run culture and artists supporting artists and kind of making opportunities. And, and I love the idea that, you know, this can be a dialogue because I'm sure all of us have been, have sat in, in front of so many Zooms that <laughs> the idea that we can have a conversation is, you know, pretty exciting for me. Um, and I think Christopher too, probably not to speak for him, but um, <laughs> it is true. We are, we are what I call permanent life life partners, um, an artist couple. So that's, that brings its own, you know, interest and, and, and uh, fun, I would say. Um, so I'm, we're going to introduce each other. So Christopher is going to go first. So I'm going to introduce him. Um, Christopher Kazmarek is a New York based artist whose work spans both experimental and traditional practices, including sculpture, site specific installations, performance, video, built circuits and solar powered objects. His work is often interactive and designed to guide the viewer towards a deeper contemplation about the inhabited environment. Recent interests have been concerned with the act of walking as a praxis for artistic production and the shapes in which collective and collaborative environments can be formed to become spaces where imagination and creativity are used in the service of hopeful outcomes. He has had the opportunity to present work at national and international galleries and festivals such as Art Souterrain in Montreal, the Trinity College Science Gallery in Ireland, the Byzantine Museum of Agios Germanos, Greece, the New York Hall of Science, New York, Real Artways in Connecticut, the Wexner Center for the Arts in Ohio, Art Museum of the Sichuan Fine Arts Institute in China, artwork art walk projects in Edinburgh and the Zong Institute for Contemporary Art South Korea. He's currently assistant professor of interdisciplinary art at Montclair State University and the coordinator of the visual arts uh, program there. And I'm, I'm just saying I'm really honored to be here in such a venerable New York institution that I've known for so many years. It's really, it's fabulous. So thank you so much. And uh, hand it over to Christopher. Thank you. So yeah, I'm going to share screen here. And just so you all know, once I start sharing screen, I can't see you anymore. <laughs> so if I just, if you're like raising your hand that I'm just cruising on through, I apologize. <laughs> but here we go. I'm going to share screen here and hopefully you all see something that says hi. <laughs> and again, I can't see you. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good, good. <laughs> all right. So uh, hi. I actually just want to take a moment to focus not on me and my work, but on, on all of us and what we're doing here. Um, I, I know it's at times perfunctory to give a, a note of thanks to the organizing body and the attendees of an event, but I really, really want to take a real moment to recognize and consider Artists Talk on Art as an institution. Uh, Artists Talk on Art has been a forum for visual artists in New York City for nearly half a century, and it is the longest running panel series in art history. Uh, begun in 1974, it has offered talks by more than 7,500 artists, artists like Louise Bourgeois, Judy Chicago, Christo and Jean-Claude, Robert De Niro, The Gorilla Girls, Lucy Lippard, Robert Longo, Alice Neal, Robert Maplethorpe, Anna Mendieta, Judy Pfaff, Jerry Saltz, Irving Sandler, Carolee Schneeman, Hannah Wilkie, Kehendi Wiley, and Fred Wilson, just to mention a few. And it has presented to an audience of hundreds of thousands, an audience of people just like you. So I just wanna take a moment to really think about that, to call attention to the fact that we're all brought here together in this space and time for a brief instance, through a long standing tradition. And in this instance, we're connected to a deep and a complex historical line that spans back almost half a century and will hopefully continue forward indefinitely. We have followed the lines of our lives to have them all intersect, to all connect with the here and the now, and also through this moment with the past and the future. Uh, we have joined a community on the timeline that has been built by artists talk on art, one that spreads out from the now in both directions. 
Now, why am I so intent on describing lines of connection between timelines and communities and institutions? Well, this is the part where I actually start to talk about my work. Uh, my name is Christopher Kesmarek, and I think I'm entitling this talk, The Line is Behind Us. And again, why am I so interested in articulating lines and connections? Well, over the past three years, I have been specifically interested in walking as a praxis for art making. You might say this began in 2016. Uh, I walked the Camino de Santiago with my partner. Uh, the Camino de Santiago is a walking pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela with many established routes, as you can see here. The most popular and the one that we undertook a portion of is the French way. Uh, this path begins in France at the city of saint jean pied de port and travels approximately 600 kilometers across northern Spain to Santiago de Compostela the legendary burial place of St. James. Uh, there are many reasons to walk the Camino. Mine was out of devotion and love to my partner. It was something that she had wanted to do for a very long time. I myself was not a hiker or a walker, uh, but I found early joy in researching the Camino. I, I do love some research, many artists do. <laughs> and in that research, some things stood out. While being long established as a Christian pilgrimage, the story of the Camino path itself extends significantly before the reported finding of St. James's remains in the ninth century. Uh, archaeological evidence shows that Celtic people had traveled it a thousand years before the birth of Christ in search of land's end, the sun's resting place. To this day, many pilgrims continue their journey beyond the Cathedral de Santiago to Finisterra, which is Latin for land's end, uh, and on the western tip of the Iberian Peninsula. The historical connection between the route that we would be taking and those who had traveled it for over 3,000 years created an extraordinary foundation for the experience, uh, a connecting line, if you will. I had not undertaken the experience of walking the Camino de Santiago as part of an artistic practice. Uh, my creative work prior had been deeply interdisciplinary spanning both traditional and experimental sculptural practices through a broad variety of mediums, uh, primarily consisting of installations and performances with aspects of audio and video that were often interactive. I worked to design experiences that would encourage the viewer towards a deeper contemplation about the environments they inhabit and the passive and active roles that their interactions took as they engaged with those environments. Uh, I had also worked in experimental sound performance and with different aspects of social practice. While these artistic approaches seemed fairly removed from the ideas of a walking pilgrimage, there were many characteristics of the Camino experience that resonated with my artistic experience and, and just would not let go. I found that when the Camino de Santiago was considered through a contemporary art lens, it had much in common with the aspects of social practice and strategies for active engagement that I had utilized in my installation work. Um, while the context may be created externally, the audience makes the work in real time through their participation. Um, the participation is experiential and interactive with time, space, and other people. And it builds a collective community through the shared experience. In my own practice, I've worked extensively with experiential ideas of social practice. Uh, and community building through shared experience and the development of mutual goals. And the Camino proved to be an environment that distinctly resonated with these ideas through the incredible level of engagement generated by the transformative power of the walk. If being evaluated as a work of contemporary art, the Camino, in my humble opinion, would be a raging success. And this led to a few years of investigating the contemporary walking pilgrimage through the lens of an artistic practice. And that led me to labyrinths. <laughs> While the original historic purpose of the creation and, and the walking of labyrinths is unknown, actually, there has been a connection made between the act of walking a labyrinth and the act of walking a pilgrimage, which is how I arrived at labyrinths from the idea of pilgrimages. Uh, this connection has been referenced and repeated so many times that the idea of the form of the labyrinth and the act of walking one uh, as being specifically created to reflect the traditions of the Christian pilgrimage is, is often taken as fact. 
This is easily refuted by the actual fact that examples of labyrinth forms can be accurately dated to more than 3,000 years ago, and to the fact that labyrinths are often crafted as part of a natural landscape with materials found locally. So even earlier labyrinths could be understood to have been obscured or absorbed by the land. And the form of the labyrinth was the direct inspiration for two major physical works. These works were developed utilizing the form of the Seven Circuit Classic Labyrinth to create site-specific installations. The Seven Circuit Classic Labyrinth is one of the most ancient. Uh, the actual origin of it as a form is not known, uh, but most of the oldest known representations of a labyrinth take this form. Uh, the first work, Labyrinth, was selected to be included as part of the inaugural and exhibition of commissioned works for the New Canaan Sculpture Trail. The work was installed at the Watson Symington Land Preserve, which is part of the New Canaan Land Trust in New Canaan, Connecticut. Over the course of four days, I cleared a 60 foot diameter space in the underbrush off of one of the trails, mapped out the form of the labyrinth, and with the help of two volunteers, who I am forever indebted to, <laughs> carried several tons of local rock to the site. Uh, this rock was used to form the lines of the labyrinth, uh, and while initially intended to be a one-year installation, the Land Trust has asked for this work to remain as a permanent installation. Uh, I've agreed to this, as you might imagine, uh, because you can also probably imagine how much work it would be to move all the rocks back. Um, and, and as this work persists, so does the community and, and the connections that are made through it. In fact, uh, there is going to be a solstice event at the Labyrinth coming up on June 19th. Uh, I hope I can see all of you there. <laughs> the second physical Labyrinth was included in the exhibition Open Air, which was hosted by the Alexei von Schilp Gallery at Yukon in Avery Point, Connecticut. Uh, this Labyrinth was also utilizing the form of the Seven Circuit Classic Labyrinth, but this time, the lines of the labyrinth were formed with over 2,000 individually placed orange survey flags. Uh, the call for proposals encouraged artists to consider the specific nature of the site, which being out at the end of a peninsula was really quite windy. Uh, in response to this, I utilized the survey flags so that together the individual pieces would converge to become an active line energized by the environment itself. Uh, this work has proven to be quite successful in its impact in the community, uh, as several other artists have responded to it in song and video, uh, including one who took to the air to record it through drone footage, uh, who I can give thanks to for capturing these overhead images. Uh, and here we see it from quite high above to give you a little bit more idea of the scale and the setting. Christopher, I do want to ask, I, I, Certainly. See, the, I see the shape that you're using. Um, I'm going to assume, maybe I'm wrong, that there are many different possible shapes. How did you come up with that shape? Or am I wrong? Is that like the standard labyrinth form? Is that referencing a medieval labyrinth? Tell us more about the specifics. Quite beautiful, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, the classic seven circuit labyrinth, like I mentioned, is, is one of the oldest known forms of the labyrinth. Uh, and uh, it, it, it dates back to over 3000 years. And I, I selected it partially because it's it's fairly simple on a certain level. I mean, there's the the like you said the the the, the charts labyrinth and those kind of things. There's a lot more turns and twists, and but I also selected it because of its it's kind of like was at the beginning uh, when we start talking about lines and connections. For me, it was important to like where where was the sort of start of this, and it's also a labyrinth that has has been found all over the place. You know, there there are like you say the Renaissance labyrinth that was part of what we might call Christian traditions and certain time periods. This has been found in all cultures, basically, uh, you know, North American, European, Asian, and uh, places that we wouldn't necessarily even know that they were connected uh, in, in direct ways. So it, it, it has this root in this history that was fascinating to me. Uh, so that, that's kind of where I started with that labyrinth form. This, this might sound like an odd comment, but looking at that view right there, I can't help but see a smiling face. <laughs> no, I can see how you say with the two things coming in, becoming the eyes and then the central part becoming the mouth. Yeah, the, the way that, that it's it's rotated. Huh. <laughs> I, I hadn't seen that before, but I see it now that you mention it. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out why that became, you know, if it became 
a standard form in different cultures. Why did that happen? What was the uh, core genesis of the idea? Um, and I do want to point out, you know, labyrinths lay out a path, a path for somebody to walk through. All of us who paint or sculpt or make any work of art, we are laying out a path for the eye to travel around. And the idea is, yes, that experience should be, uh, should elevate the, the spirit in some sense. So I think you're tackling some of the same things painters do, but you're doing it in a much more physical way. Um, and of course, engaging the environment. And I do like you, you know, just saying something as simple as walking and being in the space, you know, you're, you're making it real, so to speak. And you're putting the onus on the individual to be interactive and to feel his presence. So I respect that. And it expands our sort of uh, understanding of what art is. No, no, I thought I, you're you're sort of finding where I'm going. <laughs> Definitely, I, I I really appreciate your insight into it. This idea of active participation and the 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 art being made through the 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 the, the viewer, and the viewer isn't even a viewer per se. Like the, the, it's not a passive uh, interaction. It is very much a physical interaction, even with this idea of walking being an embodiment in the body, in the space, and having that that um, aesthetic experience. Yeah, cool. Thank you for those questions. So in terms of this piece, uh, we have this, this above one, uh, and the work was recently deinstalled. Uh, but as you can see here, a, a ghost of the line remains. And both the ridges of the grass that grew up around the line formed by the flags and in the line worn into the turf by the many that walked this path over the previous months. And speaking of lines, back to the labyrinth. <laughs> While the ideas of pilgrimage led me to the form of the labyrinth, I was also considering the elements of the form itself as a means to engage, transform, and relate to an environment through the act of walking. Experimenting with ways to interpret and unpack the possibilities of the labyrinth, I looked to, to broader ways of approaching the ideas of the form and the idea of the line as being a specific and distinctive part of the labyrinth. One of the walking works that I developed was Line is Labyrinth NYC. Uh, this was an event I hosted as part of the International Terminalia Festival of Psychogeography. And in it, I started working with the ideas of a line in an environment and the overlay of what could be considered natural and imposed lines. I wrote some thoughts about the work that I'll read while I show some pictures that document the progression of the event. A labyrinth is not a maze nor a puzzle to be solved, but a singular path to be traveled, one followed by choice, one where the destination is clearly the journey and the time and the space for contemplation the purpose. A labyrinth is a line, often considered as a line convoluted with compounded twists and turns. The very word labyrinthian is a term to describe that which is complicated and intricate, but at its core, at the heart of it, a labyrinth is just a line. One without distractions, one without choices and options. It is a singular line to follow. One that is chosen by the walker, not forced upon them by the built environment. The invitation to walk a labyrinth is just that, an invitation. It is not a demand or even a request. It is an option, one chosen when you feel the need, the pull, the desire. The desire to take on a path or a pilgrimage, it is a chance to set out with an intention, a question. It works best when you don't try to answer that question, but just walk with the question and see how it changes and reveals more of itself with each footstep. According to some urban planning experts, Broadway was New York City's earliest desire line, following as it does the Native American made Wakwiskek path which is thought to have been the shortest walking route between pre-colonial settlements in Manhattan. Broadway is the only remaining path, according to architect and urban planner, Ricardo Mariani, that wasn't wiped out by the European grid being overlaid on it. In this work, this historic path of desire becomes the line of a labyrinth progressing through the city, a singular line progressing from the most Northern to the most Southern tips of Manhattan. 
This line becomes an urban labyrinth of desire. On Sunday, February 23rd, 2020, I invited all who felt the need, pull, or aspiration to undertake a walking pilgrimage to join me down the urban labyrinth of desire that is the street of Broadway. Uh, the group convened at nine o'clock Saturday morning on the Broadway Bridge and then progressed down Broadway to Battery Park where they ended their journey at 4.30 p.m. And here are the intrepid walkers who made it all the way to the end. Uh, you might recognize the, the beautiful woman in black on the right there. <laughs> Another new walking work that I developed with the idea of the line as central was entitled Tapping the Lines. Uh, Tapping the Lines is a performative work that is both experienced and created by the participant. Like many historic conceptual pieces, the work is defined by a written prompt and exists only during the time it is being created or enacted by the participant. Tapping the Lines is a relational experience where the urban environment is both acoustically observed with intention and directly interacted with through the action of walking. At its core, the work consists of four simple instructions that create the opportunity for an experience both subtle and profound. Number one, Select a single street in an urban environment. Number two, insert thumbtacks into the bottom of your shoes. Number three, walk the entirety of the selected street from one end to the other. And finally, number four, during the walk, use the sounds you create to improve the environment. The selection of a line to follow forms a space for the performance that is both finite and determinate. It creates a fixed path with a beginning and ending point for the performance. Uh, the length of the chosen path is up to the performer. They have complete agency in the selection. Once the path is chosen, it relieves the participant from navigational decisions while traveling along the path and allows for a focus on the interactive actions. The simple act of inserting thumbtacks into the soles of a pair of shoes transforms what are typically fairly silent modes of transportation into intentional acoustic agents that cannot be denied or ignored by the walker. Um, they become tools that create a space where the walker has a heightened awareness of the acoustic environment they walk through as they contribute and interact with it through their presence. The walk itself, with the directive to use the sounds created to improve the environment, becomes an improvisational collaborative performance. A heightened awareness of the walker's contribution to the environment creates changes in their actions to, to, to reflect and to suit the space. Uh, there becomes a focus on the sonic agency of the individual within the field of sonic urbanism. The walker adjusts their gates, their rhythm, and perhaps even has purposeful moments of stillness or responsive action. As they navigate this urban landscape, they embody creative decisions. Their actions, guided by the interplay between sounds that are observed and that are created, uh, the performer becomes not just an observer or a passerby, but a contributor to and a collaborator in the improvisational collective soundscape. And we're gonna take a step back here, form a line backwards, if you will, and connect some of the dots from the past to the now. As I mentioned earlier, I have a, a historically worked with interactive site-specific installations and such, and I'd like to tell you about one that I made back in 2016 which you may actually remember was also the year which we walked the command Camino the, and had that, I had that transformative experience. Um, and, and for this work, uh, a curator from the Susquehanna Museum who had seen a piece I did as part of the IEA residency at Alford approached me to make an interactive work for a technology art exhibition they were organizing. Or more specifically, they were looking for work to go in their Van Gogh gallery, which is this magnificent beast. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that beauty. Uh, being a rural museum, they have developed this really great project where they gutted an RV and built it out to be a traveling gallery and driving curated exhibitions around and bringing them directly to the people they serve, rather than waiting for the people to come to them. Uh, a really fabulous idea that I'm really, really happy to have been a part of. And I made something that looks like this. But what is this? <laughs> What's happening here? Um, what I ended up doing was creating a work whose content was provided by the journey and the experience. Uh, 
a, a philosophical collapsing of travel and location with the viewer and systems. Uh, how did I do that, you ask? Uh, I'm glad you ask. You ask a lot of good questions. Um, well, I did a bit of coding work in Max, which is a graphical programming language. It produces what are called patches. Uh, the first patch is activated by Ross, the, the curator and the amazing guy that drives the RV. Uh, and he activates that patch when he leaves the museum for an exhibition. So as he's driving down the road, this patch is running. And what it does is capture five second clips of video from a camera mounted on the front of the RV during the drive. Uh, every five seconds, there's a one in three chance that it's capturing a five second clip. So you end up with uh, a third of the journey captured in randomized five second clips. And these clips are all saved in a folder on the computer, giving you a big bank of five second travel clips. And once Ross arrives at the site of the exhibition, he starts a second patch. This one does a similar thing, but with another camera. And this second camera is on the inside of the exhibition space in the RV where the viewers are interacting with the work. Uh, also, instead of recording an infinitely expanding bank, this program only records five videos before it starts over again, overwriting the oldest video. This creates an eternally refreshing bank of videos from the recent past, we might say. And while doing this, the patch is also connected to a projector that is randomly selecting clips from both of these banks and mixing them together through a bunch of glitchy, effecty, and feedbacky stuff that creates a really interesting visual. And, and that is what is projected into the space itself. So this is a bit of what the patches look like. I won't go into the specifics here of what they're doing on a technical level as I don't wanna put anyone to sleep, but it's a fun accessible program that allows you to build code based upon this sort of flow chart format. Uh, it, there's a pretty steep learning curve, but it's extremely powerful and allows you to combine all different modes of information with these um, connective lines and, and enough time in practice. And now one of the odd things about this piece is that I've never actually seen it. As the content of the piece is provided both by the journey of the work to the viewer and the viewers themselves in the space, I've never seen it since I've not been able to be there during one of the times it's been shown. These images are from some of the test runs I was doing during installation. Uh, and they show some of the ways the Max patch blends together the images from the space and from a short drive we took around the block, creating a digital bleed between presence and place. You know, I sort of respect how you haven't seen what you've made in ways artists uh, were like a snowball going down a hill. We start something rolling and then it continues and we don't really know what it does. You know, we have influence and impact and you set up a program which you have confidence in. And then of course it's creating uniquely each time. And there's something very beautiful about you being hands off and also about you not even knowing or seeing and only seeing stills, but certainly seeing that child's face smiling uh, <laughs> says it all. So. I do commend you on that. I want to read a few comments and then have you continue. Uh, Tiziana Razo says, this is fascinating and I'd have to agree with her. Um, uh, Yo Yarrington's, uh, sorry, Joe Yarrington says, great to hear about the context of your work, Chris. Uh, Patty Fab points out that Broadway goes up to Albany. Um, Alyssa Pritzka, who also had a great experience hiking in the mountains on a walk and through her journey on that walk, she, it definitely influenced her art immensely. Um, she, uh, she was connected with a tribal group of people um, that has really propelled her since. So uh, I just wanna mention she, a walk spoke to her and literally, spoke to her as she heard people of the, oh, I forget their names, but uh, Alyssa will tell us later. She says, congratulations, Christopher. Inspiration comes unexpectedly many times. Your walk, walk at Santiago de Compostela is a testimony to this. Um, uh, Regina Silva's asked, do people walk in the labyrinths that you showed? 
and Patricia Miranda answered yes. Many have walked in. I was very impressed when I was very impressed when the flags were taken out. The impression, the sort of time spent, was still visible. And if anybody's traveled to any of the old churches in Europe, and you walk on the steps, the steps that were once rectangular are worn in and they're curved from people walking on them. And there's some sort of art in there that it's like the weight of time that has impressed the shape of the stone. And it's hard to imagine you're doing it, but with each person walking on it, you are contributing to that shape. So there is this interconnectedness. Um, by the way, anybody jump right in. Yes, go ahead, Francine. Yeah, Barry, I, I think it might be the, uh, I, I've been to the uh, church at uh, Compostela myself. And so has um, uh, Jackie, uh, Jackie um, uh, uh, Rada. Uh, anyway, um, there's a, is that the one with the handprint in it? There's, there's a church that we saw. I, I don't know. We've been to so many churches in Europe, but there's an, it, it, so many people have put their hand in there over the centuries that it's like, it's, it's, con, it's concave. In other words, you know, it's almost like they, you know, like sticking your hand in cement, you know? Amazing. It just goes to show yeah. every little yeah, I'm not sure if it was that church, but it was one of them, you know? Every little act does have an impact. Um, and, you know, that's sort of why we should all do what we can do. Um, uh, Beth Darry asks, and you can do this later, Christopher, if you can post the information about the... Uh, NC North Carolina and the Connecticut Land Trust exhibition and any upcoming exhibits. Um, and uh, thank you, Christopher, you continue. I just wanted to jump in to let you know people are responding. Oh, no, I, I really going. appreciate it. Like I said at the start, like you, I'm just looking at PowerPoint now. Zoom isn't up when I'm sharing the screen. So <laughs> everybody's computers could have crashed and I'm just talking to myself and I wouldn't know. <laughs> I tell it. Oh no, but yeah, I, I, I really, what what you say about the steps and that kind of thing, it, it I, that actually really resonates with me. I've always been really drawn to to spaces where when you're going up the steps, you could see how they become worn by generations of interaction and how that connection, uh, that human connection through a physical object and, and a long history just continues. And and as you mentioned, like you're contributing in your small way and becoming a part of of that community of people that have walked up these steps. <laughs> I, I do want to read one more comment. Jenna Lash sort of takes us a little bit outside and I like that. She says, the piece that you made, Christopher, that is never, that you've never seen is like people who make a fine scotch, which ages over time and they'll, ne they'll never get to taste. They do it for the love of process. And I used to have a factory and we made metalworking objects, coffee pots that were used by millions of people across the country. And I had a worker who worked the machine and I would think he is literally a part of the process of every one of these pots we make, but he doesn't see the end. And I think life's like that a lot. We really, we are connected. We just don't see the interconnectivity. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I'm glad that's resonating with people. That that's very much uh, the, the ethos that I want to tap into, and and be able to allow others to tap into through through the work that I invite them to participate in. Yeah, and and yeah, th this work, never having to be able to actually see it. You know, this this is literally all I have. The, the museum is really respectful of image rights, so this is the only image of the work that I have actually, quote unquote, happening. And, and as you mentioned, they seem to enjoy it. And Ross, the curator, told me it was a huge hit. The, and they even commissioned me to make another video work for a, a really great motorcycle and art exhibition they had after that. So I guess they did really like it, but this is, this is all I have. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so why did I bring up this work from the past in terms of the, the timeline of this talk? Well, in some ways it was really prescient and, and it's, it's amazing how it has resonated already with, uh, with the audience here. Uh, and, and it encapsulates many of the things that I've been trying to consciously engage with once I focused on walking as a praxis for making work. Uh, the themes of the journey are there. The ephemeral nature of the work as experiential and in the moment is there. Uh, and it's, it's beginning to de-author 
uh, the work by creating a context that is a container rather than the actual content, uh, which here is presided, I'm sorry, which here is provided by the participants and the specifics of each of the journeys before it's exhibited. And, and now that we've drawn a line from the present in the past, we're going to take a little step forward and talk about the future. There was a good question about what's coming up um, and uh, how the engagement with the ideas of lines and communities and paths and interactions continues in my work. And I, I'm happy here to announce a new piece that will be premiered as part of the upcoming Art in Odd Places Performance Art Festival uh, that's entitled Normal this year. And the piece that I'll be performing is on May 15th. Uh, for the work Labor Lines, the work of contemplation, I'll draw 100 chalk labyrinths in a single day on the sidewalk along the two mile length of 14th Street. Uh, as mentioned before, the form of the labyrinth is often used as a structure for meditation and deliberation, uh, giving the space an opportunity to pause and reflect. But through this act of endurance, the structure of the labyrinth is unwound into a singular line traversing Manhattan and the symbols and practice of relaxed contemplation become conflated with ones of resolute production and labor. This creates tension between the normal idea of the labyrinth as a contemplative tool uh, and the normalized ideas of internalized capitalism that result in obsessive labor or production. Uh, contemplation itself has become labor and the time to engage in this form of labor is often reserved for the privileged. And through a language of repetitive performance drawing, uh, the structure of a limited time span and the particular geographic setting, the forms and applications of the assembly line in service of production are brought to the foreground in this piece. Um, to enhance this connection, the performance of the repetitive action will be done while wearing a suit and workman's gloves, uh, working on my hands and knees without stop on the busy sidewalk next to the noise and pollution from the traffic and amongst the pedestrian activity on the sidewalk steady productivity and focus on the task is made the primary objective. Aspect of health, uh, comfort, or, or even the questions of why and towards what goals the labor is undertaken are made secondary. Rest and reason are not a part of the performance. Um, taking cues from the performances of such artists as, uh, as Pope L, uh, Marilei Lederman Eucalys, this work engages with the public through the interaction of observation and discovery. While the artist is undertaking the performative drawing, the local audience will be able to observe the direct physical implementation. But there's also what we might call a long tail audience encountering the trail of labyrinths as it is being and after it has been developed. This audience encounters the evidence of the drawing action in the form of the chalk drawings on the sidewalk. Additionally, the pedestrian traffic along the route will be interacting and completing the work through actively erasing the line of the labyrinth as it is being made. Uh, one could consider that by the time the end of the line is complete, uh, that the start of it may have already been erased by a thousand footsteps, both labor and contemplation made uh, ephemeral by the overwhelming press of progress. Uh, I look forward to performing this work next month and joining the long line of artists that have been a part of the over 15 year tradition of the art and odd places activities in New York City. Uh, please do try to make it. Uh, there's going to be 60 something international artists who have been selected to participate in the normal festival this year. It'll be running from May 14th to 16th down on 14th Street and it will certainly prove to be interesting. I do hope to see you there as well. Um, now, at the start of this, I had entitled this talk, The Line is Behind Us. And most of this presentation is behind us. But I was also going to call this talk, A Line Made by Living, which is an obvious reference to Richard Long and his iconic A Line Made by Walking. But the idea is that we do form lines through the paths of our lives. Through the mere function of being alive, we create a line made by living. We are born with an array of options, and as we progress, consciously or unconsciously, we craft a line behind us, one that becomes articulated in history and that includes connections with all the communities that we have intersected with along the way. Now, this may look a bit depressing with all the past lines now closed, uh, but the key here is to consider the line that is made by living as one that is ongoing, one of connection to the past, continuous connection to the moment, and 
connected to continuous possibilities beyond the moment. As we move forward from the now, as we move forward from today, we are all leaving a point of connection, a point on the line of our life where we have joined a community connected through the institution, which is artists talk on art, one that stretches into the past and the future, one impacted by this shared experience and one of limited possibilities. The arts are a privileged space where we can contemplate these realities, but it should not be an exclusive space for such contemplation. Uh, I'm honored to have joined this line with you and humbled for what the future may hold for us as a community. Uh, thank you for listening and for being a part of this experience. May the line of your labyrinth continue forward, be long, be pleasant, and I'm truly happy that our lines have intersected today. Thank you. Wow. And now I can see you all again. Hey. <laughs> wow. I like that response. That definitely was a wow. That was mind opening. Um, I'm going to read a few comments and then open it up to anybody who wants to make their own comments. Uh, Allie Berman says, I love mazes and labyrinths so much that I create created one, a walking path that spirals within an 18 foot by 36 foot space in my garden created by small rocks that were collected over 25 years of travel to 50 countries. Wow. There's your time element. There's your link yeah. of your past. Well, and, and, and the embodiment of so many different geographic spaces coming together in that installation too. That's fabulous. Right. Very and nice. the cultures, everything. Yeah. Very nice. Connecting my life to time and travel and people I have met. Beth Darry says, fantastic. And I think she's covering what a lot of us are thinking. Uh, Alyssa Pritzka, love your lines aren't straight like our paths in real life, pointing out that, uh, you know, with bends and turns, uh, if you look at a tree, very rarely will you see a straight line. Um, Barbara Lubliner points out she's participating in uh, art, art in odd places as well. Super. Uh, as uh, she's also participating in Art Nurse, and she looks forward to seeing you there. And I've had people, friends of mine, participate in Art and Odd Places, and I would recommend it. There's something about it that's very unique and very interesting. Uh, uh, as simple as that, it, the art is happening in the street, and it becomes engaging like that. Uh, Audrey Anastasi says, I'm curious about your process. Have you a mental picture when you lay out the labyrinth? Or do you use some kind of template? I imagine you have a mental image and you um, just sort of draw it. Yeah, well, with, with the Seventh Circuit Classic Labyrinth, you know, it, it is a, a sort of fixed form that that is that form of the labyrinth. And there's some fun things you can do with some rope <laughs> and some stakes and, and create the arcs uh, and make the layout fairly simply. Uh, um, and even there's a, a very fun thing you can do in terms of drawing them where you can use what's called a seed pattern and it's very, very easy to draw as well. Um, but yeah, so, so the process of the form of the labyrinth is, is basically mechanical in terms of the production of it, yeah. <laughs> uh, Leah Poller says, the, situation, uh, the situationists, Europe 1960s, also considered walking an essential element in their process. They were political. Uh, she says, it's amazing that you avoided that element but actually she said that before you discuss yeah. <laughs> what you have coming up, um, which of course is very political and you went into the production line, assembly line. And so um, you definitely wove it in. Uh, Regina Sil Silver says, it's fascinating to see how one experience leads to another and begins a whole new art practice, which also changes. Um, no question about it. As artists, we know that. Sometimes when you create a work, you sort of make a mark, you do something and then you listen and you yeah. sort of get the next step by being open. And if you go for a walk and you can quiet yourself down and listen, you will get something that you didn't anticipate getting to. Uh, Aly Alyssa Pritzker does say that people that she uh, uh, met in South America and was very much influenced by were the Selknam people. Uh, who are very much a tribe, and you made reference to how we are now part of connecting lives. We have formed a tribe for this minute. 
And I do want to point out there are so many faces here that have become regulars and have become of our, a part of our tribe and our hive and have sort of uh, strengthened the bond. Um, Seema Gurun says, thank you. Uh, fascinating capillaries of life. And that's a beautiful way to put it. Yeah. If you have a look at uh, images of New York City that are time-lapsed and show night images of uh, car lights and you look at the lights, you realize it looks like capillaries. It looks like blood flow in a human body. And, you know, I often say, you know, like ants maybe don't comprehend the whole colony. Maybe we don't get our interconnectedness but on some higher level, we are connected, but knowing that can be very difficult. Sensing it can be possible. Um, yeah. And Ali, Ali Berman asks, what, what was the largest labyrinth you've made, Christopher? Uh, in terms of physical labyrinths, uh, probably 60, 60 feet in diameter, both the one in New Canaan and the one uh, out, out in the Croton Point were, were 60 foot labyrinths. I want to open it up to questions by anybody. Really, just to mute yourself and scream right in. That's the very Excuse organized. Me. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Sandy. Hi. Um, this is incredible. I, I, when I come to these things, I, I'm very new to art, very, very new to art, and I'm a photographer, or I hope to be, and I, I find all these things so absolutely fascinating. Um, it makes my mind spin. I don't even know what direction I'm going in. <laughs> but I just wanted to tell you that I really enjoyed your presentation. It was wonderful. And I have to excuse myself because I have another Zoom meeting at 7 o'clock, so I can't see the rest of it. <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it was a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Bye. Can, Christopher, can I ask you a question? This is Allie. And I, I'm the one who's done the labyrinths and the mazes, uh, or you know, in 50 countries, really enjoying your talk. Um, it's so wonderful because we are all connected, and the line, the whatever the line is that people are walking on, it is um, part of that connection just by the very act that they're doing it one after the other. And I think that's such an important. I see it as such an important part of your work. Now, if you were given unlimited resources, unlimited help to do something, what would your pet project be at this point? Oh my goodness. Um, I, think, I think she means what island in Hawaii would you go to? <laughs> Uh, it probably it be, wouldn't be an island. It could be Indonesia. It could be Indonesia. It doesn't have to be uh, Hawaii. <laughs> but it, it's interesting, you know. We 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 started this 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 conversation with the fact that that Patricia and myself are, are you know life partners and everything. And you you do have those conversations when you buy that uh, ticket to the lotto when it's go, gone over two hundred million. And you're like, what do you? What would we do? And 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 uh, although I think we would both continue to make work, uh, our, our, our idea of unlimited resources would probably be towards uh, creating a context where others could make work. You know what I mean? Like creating a, a center that would allow other people to, to participate and, and allow more access to the arts and, and the, the modes of contemplation and, and reflection and criticality that the arts gives a community. Because I, I think that's that's at the root when, when I'm when I'm using a labyrinth and thinking about it's a space for contemplation and thinking and engagement and all these things. Uh, I'm also a professor and and I think about my time in the classroom as as performance art. Basically, I am trying through my performance to create a transformative experience for these individuals who, at the end of the semester, should see the world in a different way. You know. Uh, so I, I, if, if I had unlimited resources, it would be like, oh, I'm going to make a bronze statue of so-and-so. <laughs> it would probably be like, I want to get a building. I want to fully fund, you know, good artists, good, have good equipment and, and have it free for people to come there and have these types of discussions as we're doing right now, which is why institutions like Artists Talk on Art is so fabulous to be a part of, you know, just sort of like expand what we're doing now with also making. <laughs> right, right. Well, I... I applaud you. I give you a round of applause. Oh, thank of you. Applause. <laughs> There's the influence. Thank you, Allie. That was a great question. That's sort of outside, you know, with unlimited resources, what would you do? And certainly a very respectable answer, Christopher. I'm going to just remind everybody we are artists talk on art. We're a 501c3. 
our website. I put it in the chat. If you ever have an idea for a talk you want to do, just reach out to me. You'll see my email there. Go ahead. The answer is yes. We'll do your talk. We'll just set a date for it. Spread the word to your friends. If you'd like to contribute to the organization, thank you. I see many faces here that have contributed, and I thank you all for contributing. I want to move on to Patricia. Uh, Christopher, go ahead. Introduce the girl that you said was very pretty sitting on the ed edge of the bench there. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> I knew it was you, Patricia. You're getting some good husband points there. By the way, they are a couple, and it's very nice to see a couple share their art. And I'm sure we're going to see how unique their art is to each of them and different. And that's sort of a nice thing, too. Yeah, so Patricia Miranda. Uh, is an artist, curator, educator, and founder of MapSpace and the Crit Lab. Uh, she's been a visiting artist at Vermont Studio Center, the Heckscher Museum, uh, University of Utah, has been awarded residencies at iPark, Ware Farm, Vermont Studio Center, and the Julio Vandez Printmaking Studio. Uh, she's received anonymous was a woman COVID-19 relief grant, uh, an artist grant from Arts Westchester, and the New York State Council of the Arts was part of a year-long NEA grant working with homeless youth. Uh, her work has been exhibited at Odetta Gallery, ABC No Rio, Wave Hill, and Rio 2 Gallery in New York City, uh, the Alex Lee Von Schilp Gallery in Yukon and Averyport, Connecticut, and the Cape Museum of Fine Art, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and the Belvedere Museum in Vienna, Austria. Uh, and she has a solo exhibition upcoming at Garrison Art Center in Garrison, New York in fall 2021. So uh, among the things that you need to see, you need to put that on your list. Okay, hi. <laughs> Welcome, Patricia. I do want to point out, I thought we had a chance at going under an hour and a half, but I sort of like that we're not going to do that. And the point is, you know, Christopher, you gave a really in-depth presentation. Every minute was worth hearing. I did see a talk that was an hour long and somehow the uh, New York Artist Circle fits seven artists in. And I thought it was great, but it, I hope you don't mind. We sort of always go over and that's because we have good content um, and uh, I like to let it run. I don't cut artists off and uh, I just appreciate everything you expressed, Christopher and Patricia, there's no limit. We've got 40 hours if you want, you know, sock <laughs> it to us, as they said in the 60s. Well, <laughs> thank you. You shouldn't say that to me because I can I can talk. But uh, <laughs> um, I was going to say, actually, if, you know, I'm, I'm happy to come back another time if people are, you know, sort of zoomed out at this point. Um, it's a little, uh, you know, I know it's a lot. We all do a lot of zooming, but um, I, uh, also wanted to say I'm going to be in an exhibition at the Newport Art Museum, um, an, an amazing exhibition about uh, hair in, in art, use of hair in art. So I'm very excited about that. That's coming up in, in June. But I'm going to share the screen. And um, if, you know, if we don't get through, I can kind of go a little quickly if necessary, um, just to kind of be respectful of people's time. Oh, not necessarily at all. We're, we're all here to hear <laughs> and to listen. So it's respect. We're here to hear what you have to say. So you take your time. Go ahead. And you can always catch up the recording, right? If you if you have to go. So um, no, I'm 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 excited to be here. And um, I will say, just in in relationship to Christopher and I, we are going. We were interviewed as an artist couple on Art Spiel, which is a wonderful online art publication that highlights um, rigorous work of mid-career, mostly marginalized visual artists, as well as nonprofit venues. They do interviews, studio visits, reviews, founded by Ed, um, Eddie Yaniv, who's an amazing artist. So I, I hope you'll, that will be May 31st, I think that's coming out. So that's artspiel.org, S-P-I-E-L. So, um, and I, I mean, it's interesting because we we decided that, you know, when, when she asked us to do this as a, as a couple to kind of have, we thought, well, let's have a conversation and just see what comes up so that it's a, you know, I think we've all done the formal Zooms and, and it was fun to do something that was a little bit more, I don't know, maybe a little bit more relaxed. And so I appreciate the way that you run this because it is, it's wonderful. Um, so as uh, Christopher said, I am an artist, curator and educator. I, I, I think of the studio as the heart of my practice and actually I'm going to just set my timer so I can really make sure I don't 
bore all of you to death. Um, I, I think of the studio as the heart of my practice and then the other kinds of projects that I do as in a sense like spokes off that off that wheel heart. <laughs> uh, and so I'm gonna, I decided tonight because I've done a bunch of talks about my recent work. So I wanna talk a little bit about a few little slightly different things. So I thought I would, oops, um, I would talk a little bit about some of the projects. So the Crit Lab is an organization that I founded. Um, it is a basically um, graduate level critique um, programs for working artists. I've written a pedagogy that I'm, I'm pretty, be proud of. It's very rigorous, but very supportive and very productive. So you really have stuff to work on. Um, it started with four or five artists in my studio and is now um, we're close to 50 people participating on a regular basis. They're five month um, sessions, one day a month. They're full day. Uh, it used to be, you know, offline. Now we've been online, which has actually been kind of amazing because it's opened up really interesting and different kinds of possibilities. Um, I'm finding, I found that, you know, and I didn't even really plan to do it. I did this one group and then it grew and grew. It grew from artists coming to me and saying, we want more engagement. We want, you know, more rigorous discourse and all of that, because it can be very difficult as artists to find that when you're outside of an academic community or you're not kind of immersed in a community like this, where you have regular opportunities to, to really share at a pretty high level. So it's been an amazing experience for me, incredibly inspiring. So the artists have a portfolio page on the website. Um, I had a number of faculty in addition to myself who, who are available for artists to work with one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and in November of this past year, I did uh, the first Crit Lab Alt MFA, which was a four-day intensive with 13 faculty and um, lots of participants. And we had lectures, artist lectures, uh, collaborative projects, um, C.W. Chandler did a drawing, a collaborative drawing project. Christopher did a walking project. And uh, we had uh, small group critiques with all of these visiting faculty. So it was a really amazing, amazing project. And I'm, I'm planning on more of these to come. Also have a residency in Italy, which uh, started in 2019, our first, our inaugural one. And of course, for all the obvious reasons, we haven't had one since, but we are definitely going in 2022. And so we spent a I don't know, four or five days at the Venice Biennale and then and then at this incredibly gorgeous place in the Alps um, in the Valcomonica Valley at Rural Contemporary Residency. And so i um, really excited about that. There, we're gonna probably have some projects like the possibility of a small museum show in Valcomonica. And so I'm, I'm, I can't wait to get back to Italy and, um, and to bring artists there. I brought 10 artists there in 2019. So that's some of the things that the Crit Lab does. Uh, I'm also the founder of Map Space, which is an exhibition project space that I've had for you know more years than I care to mention, early 2000s, let's say. And uh, that's been, you know, there's been exhibitions, there's there's been all kinds of things, educational programs. I ran a resident workspace, collaborative workspace residency program there. And uh, Beth Derry, who's here in the audience, was one of the inaugural artists for that residency program from, so that ran from 2012 to, to 16. And I really would love to kind of have that start up again, but it's a, it's kind of a flexible artist run space. So I can kind of, you know, create projects whenever something appeals to me or people get involved in all of that. So, um, that's another project. I'm also a curator, so I curate. Um, I have certain, you know, subjects that I'm particularly interested in that are related to my work. I'm obviously interested in artist-run culture, and I've also been co-founded several women's artist collectives. One of them is the London Calling Collective. I'm one of the seven co-founders of this um, group, and started with we we went to a group of people. A group of us went to London. Some of us knew each other. Some of us didn't know each other at all. Um, and it, when lockdown came, um, we sheltered in place together through WhatsApp and Zoom. And so the digital space became a space for a chosen family to support one another and all of that. And it resulted in the WhatsApp um, chat being 25,564 posts from October to October and almost 4,000 pages. And it continues to today. This, this is an exhibition of that October to October, we wallpapered the walls with the WhatsApp chat. This is only, this is not even a thousand pages of the 4,000 pages and on top of the, the, of the conversation. So you could read, you know, this very wide ranging, we talked about art and politics and the pandemic and our hopes and fears and, and all
all of that and, and our work, of course. And um, also did a collaborative project of the small books that you see in the center, which were, were made small enough to go into a New York City mailbox, like the USPS project that you mentioned earlier. Um, so that we all worked on every, every, each, all of the seven artists worked on all of the books. So we could do something together when we couldn't be physically together. We could do something through the mail. So that was Patricia, a project that, I, I, and I think- that, Patricia, I do want to say, just looking at that hang, it's visually stunning. It's both highly organized, it has its balance, and at the same time, it's filled with minutia that makes me want to jump in and all the different colors. I, I do appreciate and I do understand the work that goes in to make something like that. Um, it is quite a stunning uh, uh, hang that you did there. Thank you, thank you. We tried to find, I mean, I could tell you long stories about the the, the impossibilities of trying to print a $4,000, I mean, a 4,000 page document. Um, yeah, I mean, you could go in and look at intimate conversations between the artists that, you know, we posted pictures of the whole range. And I think, you know, as a pandemic archive, I feel like it has real historic significance of this this group of seven women artists who, who kind of um, did this project. To, actually, we didn't do this as a project. We did this as a, it was a pandemic conversation that we then realized was a pretty important archive. Um, so that was, a, that was a wonderful project and co-curated by Ale um, Alexi Brock, who's another one of the artists in the collective, I have to say that. She and I worked on this together and it's fabulous. So um, I, you know, in my curatorial practice, I in many ways reflects my own studio practice. I, I work a lot in my own work on ideas around environmental grief, uh, solastalgia. And so I curated a show um, in Cambridge Arts Center and I don't know if it was 2018, I can't, can't remember, but um, of an uh, artists who are working around ideas of environmental grief. Um, and this show was goes back a few more years, but I felt like it was really, I'm, I'm sort of a little bit picking uh, just a few projects to show you, but I wanted to show this one because this is a project uh, that I co-curated with Amy Lipton and we lost Amy Lipton this year. She passed away from cancer and she was an amazing, amazing um, curator and just an incredible human, the director of Eco Art Space in New York. And this was at Concordia uh, Gal Concordia College Gallery, where I was the director for four years, beautiful space. And you can see a Jackie Bruckner dirt chair on the left and um, just it, uh, an amazing show with incredible artists. Um, and I just wanted to shout out to, to, to Amy um, since we lost her this year. I also uh, often am curating uh, uh, exhibitions on the intersections between art and science or art and technology. It's another arena of real interest for me. And this was an exhibition called Technobody about our relationship, our bodies, our physical bodies relationship to the, to the digital body. Um, it was a really fantastic show at Pelham Arts Center in Pelham, New York. And in the fall, I'm doing another exhibition, still, still in progress working. I, a couple of the artists that were in the Technobody show will be in it. It'll be at Southern Connecticut State University in the fall. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I also teach, uh, I've taught at the university level, you know, a lot, but I also develop programming for K through 12 museums and institutions. I'm not really going to talk about that now, but I have to show you this picture because <laughs> this was at the Children's Museum. And this is um, the reaction when I told these uh, young people that that was a little bug that they were making um, color with. <laughs> so cochineal is a really big uh, part of my practice. And so um, this is one of my favorite pictures from, and that's a program I did at the Children's Museum. Uh, so this is my studio. This is what my studio might look like on a, on a random day. Uh, might look very different on another day, but this is um, me um, dyeing the lace and, and linens with, this is with cochineal insect dye, which I'll, I can talk about a little bit. Um, and so I'm working with textiles. I'm interested in textile as a form that you know, wraps our bodies from cradle to grave, speaking of, speaking of line. Um, and I'm interested in, in the role of lace making in the lives of women historically. Um, my work is very rooted in, it's grounded in deep research in historic material practices, uh, rituals of grief and mourning, women's labor, and the violence of env environmental and gendered uh, commodification. So I work primarily with textiles in, um, in kind of site responsive installation work. So this is an example of, of that. And so um, one of the interesting things that happened during the pandemic is I began to make these, I started working with lace and linens from my grandmothers, my Italian grandmother, Ermena Gilda, Eugenia Glorinda Fangaroli, um, and my, my Irish grandmother, Rebecca Cogan. Um, I, had, I had lace from both of them and began to work with that. And I had posted on social media 
you know, an image of myself dyeing some lace. And uh, I had this amazing response. People started contacting me and saying, I have lace, Do, would you like some lace? And so um, these two projects uh, are, are made, and this happened, this was, uh, you know, early on in the pandemic, in the, in the kind of really in the, in the beginning, I was in my studio because of course, everything I had <laughs> scheduled had been um, canceled. So I had this time to work on these projects and people began sending me lace. So this was one of the first boxes of lace I got from an artist in Florida who I didn't know. Um, and she sent me this lace and said, you know, enjoy, I'd love to see what you do with it. And, um, and the lace kept coming. And so to the point where these two installations, which are quite, they're about 15 foot wide by, I don't know, you know, 12 or so feet high, they, they range a bit depending on where they're installed, um, are all done completely using lace that people sent me unsolicited or during the pandemic. And so I began to get these boxes of lace. And after I've got several of them, I realized that this was, um, I mean, amazing, first of all, the generosity of people, people wanting to participate and be part of the project. And um, also, you know, that this was, people became collaborators in the project, right? That this was their lace. And so I realized that I needed to begin to document the lace. Now, sadly, that particular box that I just showed you, because it was the first one, I took a picture of the box, but I didn't take a picture of all of the pieces of lace. Now, when I get the lace, I have a really kind of um, pretty in-depth lace archive that I take a picture of every single piece that people send me. And I have I mean, I have dozens and dozens of boxes of lace that people have sent me. And so I, I document it, I photograph it, I measure it. Um, and I'm, this is becoming an ongoing lace archive that I hope to turn into some kind of, you know, kind of very, very idiosyncratic personal research um, book, artist book, and also begin to research the, the patterns of the lace, the lineage of the lace, and the, 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 Speaking of lineage, right? There's the line. A lace is a line, basically. Uh, lace is just a, is a thread that gets woven around and around, it, um, and it has this lineage that goes way back in time. And so the the uh, lace archive has become a really important part of it. Again, not something I had thought of. I was working with family lace. I didn't really know, you know, where it would go, and people started sending me, and that's become a really powerful part of the um, project. Um, this is an, so a piece. Let me ask you, I'm just curious. So I always like to yeah. see like, how does an artist get to their materials? And you did say you're working with family lace, but I don't know if I want to ask you, tell me something about the art that you did when you were a child, or what is it about lace that drew you to lace? Yeah, I mean, I probably, I probably need uh, two, two sessions to talk about that. I think it's, you know, I think it's a, a, a bunch of layered things. So one of the things, something that's really important was, well, I had this family lace. I had been making, I had been working in installation and sculpture um, it, previously to working with textile. And I began to think, I, I work with natural dyes and pigments. I've been doing that for, for decades. And that's been a really fundamental part of my practice. I think of materials as not as, not merely as aesthetic, right? I think of them as carriers and as witnesses of historical, ecological, and cultural information. So if I'm using lace, the story of that lace becomes part of the work. And so um, I also was thinking about, I wanted to work large. And I was thinking about the, I was thinking about the machismo of large, art installations and the kind of ecological footprint that, that that requires, right? And so working with textile allowed me to make pieces that were really large, right? But this folds down into a very soft light, like a quilt box, right? And that meant, and all of the materials are perfectly uh, eco-friendly. I could bury this and it wouldn't harm anyone. The dyes are natural, all of that. And so I, I thought, how can I make monumental work with a small ecological footprint. So that was part of it. And then of course the part of it was, um, you know, having this store of family lace and beginning to want to explore it um, a little bit more deeply in connection with, you know, my family and all of that. And I was interested in, in again, in the ideas around domestic labor that are connected with lace, the role that lace played in women's lives and how important that was. Another thing that came out in the, in the pandemic, of course, was this idea of domestic labor. I mean, I had been working with ideas around domestic labor before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, all of our domestic labor became visible, right? And that was, became this kind of another layer, <coughs> excuse me, another layer of subtext in the work was this idea of the domestic, like hidden domestic labor becoming visible, right? Our, our, our homes were facing the street. People were teaching their children at home and working at home. And all of a sudden that hidden labor, the precarious hidden labor became visible. So that's a subtext in the work also. And then I'll just say that um, 
I, I work with materials that have long cultural histories. And what, what I mean by that is these are all materials that have been used throughout art history are really kind of um, important materials art historically, right? So they're, they're not random materials. And I use that because I'm very interested in the histories that those materials bring. For example, the cochineal insect in, these, in this particular body of work, um, cochineal is a, an insect that is indigenous to uh, Mexico and Central and South America. It, before the Spanish came to the Americas, nowhere else on the planet did cochineal exist. They had other insect uh, dyes, very few. There's kermes, which is where we get the term crimson. There's lac, which is also shellac. And, um, and so when the Spanish came to the Americas and discovered that the indigenous Mesoamerican people were using this cochineal dye as part of their, they, they dyed their clothing with it, they used it as a paint. Um, they took it, they, they brought it back to Spain and were able to hide for more than 100 years the source of this red dye. It revolutionized the dye trade. It's the beginning of modern globalization and helped keep Spain a great power. So it had this very important and kind of unseen role in the, um, in the conquest. Now, it, this work is not about the conquest of the Americas, right? But it has these sub texts that are in the work that one can investigate if one chooses to. And they start by the kind of um, the first level of the aesthetic of the material, the very domestic, the very feminine lace that has this history of women, you know, hand making this in their homes. And then the history of how these dyes moved around the uh, around the planet and the impacts that those had, which were enormous. So I think I don't know if that <laughs> answers your question or makes it more um, complicated. But I think that's uh, some of the ways I think about because I think about materials um, from a research point of view first, right? I start with uh, like the, the sort of gathering a lot of this, these research ideas around me and then work with the materials intuitively once I'm, I've sort of kind of gathered that information around me. I, um, I, these are I also- think you, I think you answered it beautifully. <laughs> I just want to read a few of the comments. Uh, Lisa yeah. Pritzker says, organic, beautiful, and material that is close to many, us, many of us. Uh, Brava Patricia. Jenna Lash points out the materials that connect all your processes and the people touched by it create a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. You certainly are creating lines like Christopher has to the past and you're sort of bringing it forward. Eloisa Pomfret, beautiful work. Uh, and Beth Darry, the archive is wonderful and gorgeous photographic images in themselves. Um, Alyssa Prisca points out that Amy was a pioneer, an amazing voice about environmental art. Um, and I do wanna say, uh, Cochineal has, has come to the forefront in artists talk on art before. We had somebody mention it, it was Greek to me, but when you mention it, I'm like, I know that material. And uh, I think there's a nice synchronicity here where you've brought it up. Um, it's just nice to see. So continue. Well, that's, you're doing that's great. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I would, I mean, I'd love to know who that is. Well, I think there's much more interest now in natural dyes and pigments. So that's, I think I've been working with them for, you know, before anybody, <laughs> people were like, what are you doing? Um, and now I think there's much more interest. Oh, and I did have to say that um, Beth Derry and Jeff Wallace are the curators of this space. I meant to put that in. And I wanted to really acknowledge them for inviting me to do this this um, project in this space. The other thing about this space, of course, it was it's open to the street. And this is another long New York institution this main main window in Dumbo has been being curated for 40 plus years. And um, when artists first moved to Dumbo and in the during the pandemic, it was also amazing because it was open to the street. So it was there, you know, it was there, it was visible to people. There was no entry fee, no, no kind of barrier to, to see the work. It was um, right there on the street for everyone to see. So I, I feel like, you know, um, many thanks to Beth um, and Jeff and, and it was a wonderful, really wonderful project. I was really honored to be um, asked to do it. And um, so you can see here, close up, and you can, I, I, I call myself an intentionally sloppy dyer. You know, I don't, I don't filter the vat. Things are dyed four or five times to get the kind of level of color and also to kind of get the, 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 the I don't filter the material. So there's, there's material on, you can kind of see in some places where you can see the residue of the dye is left on the material. I want this kind of earthy, visceral dye to be present and, and sort of that the earthiness of the and, and visceralness of the dye 
in conjunction with the, the delicacy and femininity of the lace for me is a really powerful kind of visual metaphor as well as having containing in it layers of, of kind of politic if one wants to um, investigate that. I also add on, I create these small um, ex votos or memento mori or um, objects of, I call them objects of lamentation, sort of like reliquaries um, that are body shaped or body referential. And those are made out of plaster and um, handmade paper or paper mache and those are hanging out because I do think of these as, as in some ways as kind of like shrouds or lamentation shrouds as you can see from the titles the one in Dumbo was lamentation for a recent history and the other ones were lamentation to my grandmothers and so you know the ex voto tradition goes back it, it, it's in a way it's like labyrinths right that 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 it was that it became a very powerful um thing in the in a Christian tradition but also predates that and and you'll find some some forms of memento mori's all over the world in lots of different cultures and basically they were body forms that were placed in, you know in a church or or for, in front of a deity in order to um in like in request in gratitude devotion or in memoriam in memoriam so i was always been fascinated by these and had it took me a really long time to figure out a, a vernacular that made sense that didn't seem so um i don't know kitsch even though, I mean, kitsch is fine. I, I, I don't mind the kitsch element, but I, it took me a long, but I was more interested in a little bit more in the kind of mournful. And I, so it took me a long time to figure out how to work with these materials, but I feel like I've finally done it. And this was a seminal piece that kind of helped me find a new language using these materials. This is a piece that was, um, that I was commissioned to make for Keene University an exhibition there. And this is again, found linens. These are embedded with red clay, not with cochineal. Um, and red clay is really a fascinating material. It's been used by every culture all around the world. It's in paint and other and all that. It's even embedded in our language. In the um, Hebrew, the root word Adam has three meanings. It means man, red, and clay in the idea that, that we came from the red clay. And that's true in the Western tradition. It's also true in, in Australian Aboriginal traditions. The red clay has always been something that has been considered um, kind of a, a sort, you know, a, a, like a, like a source of our of, of where we came from and a, and a sacred material and you know we we as human beings we all have the same materials on the planet I think that's one of the reasons why I, fa I find them fascinating right and they're used in really in very different ways and then in overlapping ways that's really fascinating so this is two large pieces of cloth uh, they're about six foot so they're and they hang and the um the bottom one has these metal milagros which are the metal um, little milagros that you find in Mexico. So these are Mexican ones. And the other ones on the top are plaster that I made myself. So th this was an important piece for me because it helped me kind of find a new way to use the, those memento mores. Um, this was an exhibition I had at Odetta Gallery thanks to Alan Hackle-Fagan, who we mentioned earlier, uh, for inviting me to do an installation during a pandemic. <laughs> um, a full, I got to install these pieces and you can see there how different they are hanging in different places. This was hanging away from the wall. It had a kind of a softer look. And, um, and so that was really exciting to see that. And I also work with books. I'm not gonna talk about those so much tonight, but I wanted to talk about a couple of different things since I, I've talked about those other works quite a bit in the last six months. This is a- um, I just want to jump a, in just, just to read yeah. a few of the comments and take Please. your time. You're doing great. Obviously, if anybody has to go, they'll go, but we've, had, we, we've gone till eight o'clock. So just enjoy. Um, Tiziana Razo says, thank you very much. This was very enriching and empowering presentations. I love how Christopher is creating a new experience of the map of the city. I'm fascinated by the expansive and creative experience created by Patricia's work. I love the idea of a line formed by intimate conversations that become history or by historical material, laces that are thread together to create conversations. Amazing work. Tiziana, you said that beautifully. Um, Beth Thank Barry you, points out, it was an amazing installation and the neighborhood community and visitors loved it so much. It really brought people together. Uh, Francine Kornfeld uh, echoes that saying stunning installations, Patricia. Um, Rim Grad says the story about Spain co-opting co the die is fascinating and the work is stunning that you do. Um, and yes, just to continue, take your time, Patricia. I just wanna to say to everybody, 
This is Artist Talk on Art. There's more information on our website, if you like, uh, atoanyc.org. We're here every Monday. And uh, thanks, Patricia. Patricia. You're doing great. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for those comments. Yeah, I think that the, I, you know, those narratives about cochineal, which, by the way, is still in use. It's one of our only non-toxic red food dye. So we most of us have consumed it in one food or another. Um, I'm interested in those, yeah, the, the role that these materials play in a way as kind of silent witnesses. And I, I was going to talk about a project um, that I use that a lot. But anyway, the, so they're, they're sort of, they, they come along with history and they play a very important role in history. And very often these histories are invisible, right? This history of Cochineal is an invisible history. And yet it, it transformed the, the dye trade because red is a very difficult color to make in nature. And there were very few, there was only a couple of insects in the rest of the world. We're talking about Europe, the Middle East, Africa, where, and Asia, where they could get the red dye. And um, it was very difficult to cultivate. So the cochineal was uh, much easier and, and it, you know, so it, it really transformed the dye trade, this little bug and this, this, through this interaction. The other thing is when I'm teaching, I can have a, a child crush a bug, crush a cochineal bug, and I can talk about the conquest, and I can talk about really complex cultural interactions and you know hard subjects without having it become um, a, only a polarizing kind of politic, right? That 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 it's all, that it's very kind of um, like a simple a simple narrative. It's a much more complex narrative. This interaction and the way that these things happen, but. And, you know, cochineal was pretty fundamental. It played a pretty fundamental role in the conquest. In fact, I always say gold gets all the press, right? Because we hear about gold coming from the new world, but cochineal in a way became like it dyed all the cloth, all of the pigments, the red pigments, you know, post uh, mid, six, mid uh, 1600s um, is going to be cochineal. So, or mid, mid late, late 1500s to 1600, then all of those red dyes. So it's like, you know, it, it has this very, it, it insinuates itself into the culture and the way that materials move right around the world is reflective of the way that we as humans move around the world. And it's reflective of the kinds of conflicts and, and interactions and positive, both positive and negative, right, that we have. So I think, I think of materials that way and I use them um, in that way. So um, I wanted to talk about a couple of different things because, <laughs> and uh, this was my proposal for the um, open air sculpture, um, uh, exhibition where Christopher had the labyrinth, I proposed uh, a project where I would wrap these, I call them the nonna trees. They have these really enormous um, grandma trees. They're huge, they're like 18 feet around on the campus. They're very, very, very old and they're really, really large. So I proposed, you know, wrapping the, the nonna trees in, in, the, um, in the, the doilies and the curator Charlotte Gray loved that love that idea. And um, I show this because I know that there are artists in this audience. And so thinking about how one puts a proposal together and the proposal was accepted. And then when we were driving up there to install, literally in the car, I, the curator called me and said, you know, the facilities people don't, won't let us install on the big old trees. Cause you know, and that made sense. They were old trees, but it was literally on the way. And so we had to move the project and, um, they, they, they let up, they said, you can do it on these trees and not these trees. And, um, you know, their role is to protect the trees. So I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. And so we, I ended up installing them on the trees that kind of line the entryway to the campus, which was wonderful, made the project have a very different kind of feeling, but, um, but I think it still was a wonderful project. Um, and it, you know, it's just an, an indication of how one, when one is working in public spaces or in kind of institutional spaces, how one often has to adjust the things that one makes. This is the final installation. Um, one has to adjust things because the spaces have their own requirements and that being kind of flexible and all of that is an important part of being an artist working in these kinds of spaces. Patricia, um, Patricia you also do something important. We all see trees and we know them. And so what happens is when we walk by them, we actually don't see them. We sort of in our mind tree and you know just go to the next object. But by you covering the trunk the way you cover it, right away we are forced to look at it and we sort of see the tree in a new way. And I think that's a lot about what art is about, you know, maybe contemplating the obvious in a different way or contemplating the esoteric, but you definitely get us to focus on something that we know very well, but we really don't know very well. So I applaud you. For yeah, that. I think, I think, yeah, I think that, I think that art, um, you know, its job is to, to, 
give us new ways to pay attention, um, to pose questions, you know, put questions on the table and raise questions and all of that. And so, yeah, I think that's, um, thank you. Yeah, I, and, and it, you know, lines the entrance. So they sort of felt like this, your grand promenade down the, down the, the, the driveway into the campus. That's the entrance right there. Um, this is a project that's a little more kind of, um, you know, it was a one night, it was a pop-up. I actually on site, wrapped the tree with the white and dyed the materials on site and put them onto the the tree it was this uh, like a fun kind of um bomb pop-up production which is uh run by two young artists gabby collins fernanda fernandez and um drea cofield in brooklyn and you know allow the dye to kind of bleed onto the onto the cloth and all of that and and so that was just an example of another kind of um outdoor project um and those kind of all grew out from the lineage of those projects is this project in 2016 when I did a residency at I Park where I um, wrapped these trees in the forests of, of I Park, which is an amazing residency program in, in Haddam, Connecticut that has, a I don't know, 150 acres or something and, and does a lot of environmental um, programming and stuff. And the, the twine was dyed with oak galls that I gathered from the property. Um, and so that, that kind of was the beginning of these outdoor projects of which there have been others, but I'm just showing you that one. And then I'm just gonna show you a project that um, was uh, another collaborative project. I felt like I wanted to focus on this again a few years ago, but I got a grant to do a project and to focus on another material. So in this case, the material was oak galls, which are small wasps nests. So I got a grant to gather and collect oak galls from around the country. Uh, I, I gathered them from art centers, in, both local and, oh, I'll come back to that, local, I'll come back to that, local and from around the country. People sent me oak galls and, um, I invited 10 artists to join me in this project. And an oak gall is a small uh, wasp nest. It's a wasp nest that is um, created by the oak wasp, which is a tiny little wasp about the size of a sesame seed. And the, gall, oh, the oak wasp doesn't have the ability to make a nest. So like it's not a paper wasp, it can't build its own nest. So it has a chemical in its eggs. It lays its eggs on the branches of the tree, most often the branches, uh, sometimes the leaves. And, the, and the, there's a chemical reaction and the tree forms this gall around the eggs and uh, the wasp gestates in there, bores a little hole and um, flies out. Now, why is a oak wasp and the oak gall interesting? Because um, oak galls are one of the two, one of the sources for, is the source for one of the two most common inks used all throughout history. So again, this lineage of a historical material. And um, just to go back to this picture, this is um, Kinsey and everyone would probably knows the Kinsey report, right? The, those reports on human sexuality. Well, Kinsey was, before he was, um, before he studied human sexuality, he was an entomologist and studied uh, the insect sexuality and was the foremost expert on um, the sex life of the oak wasp and donated the largest collection of oak galls to the Museum of Natural History. So just in your weird sort of little nerdy history there. Um, so why, so why is, um, why are oak galls, used for ink, um, well, I'll just show you here. Here are some of the oak galls that were collected. I had some of the horticulturists at Massachusetts Audubon collected some for me. I gathered some, um, some people sent from Texas and California. And then the Aleppo ones, of course, come from Syria. And to just kind of make a, you know, an analogy to like thinking that materials are affected by history or are part of our history, the oak galls, the small oak galls on the right are the ones that I've been getting from Aleppo in Syria for many, many, many years. And the minute the war in Syria started, I have not been able to get those Aleppo oak galls. The ones on the left are the ones that I can get now. They're equally good. There's just a diff slightly different species, um, either of oak tree or, or wasp. And I'm sure they're coming from the Aleppo region of Turkey because Syria has been pretty much utterly destroyed. And so we can't get any oak galls from Syria anymore. So even in this you know, day and age, these, of course, these um, materials are still traveling according to what's going on in human culture. So um, one of the reasons that oak galls are, and these are some local ones, are so important is they make an iron gallic ink. They're very high in tannins and gallic acid. And um, the, um, and that makes a very good ink. In fact, the word ink, and it's a it, the word ink comes from the Latin word in costume, which means to burn in. And this is uh, in direct relation to the oak gall because it's an iron gallic ink. 
And so because it's an iron gallic ink, it is acidic. And so it bites the paper, right? It bites away at the paper. So oak gall ink has been used for thousands of years, going back to the Dead Sea Scrolls, all medieval manuscripts before the printing press, the Declaration of Independence, all legal documents, anything that was on animal skin, legal documents up to the 20th century. And Hebrew Torah is still written with an, with an oak gall iron gallic ink. And um, also interestingly about oak gall ink is that the word palimpsest, which we love as artists, love this term, um, comes directly from oak gall ink because people would scrape down the manuscript pages, right? Because the animal skin was very valuable. And because the ink was caustic, it would literally bite into the skin, right? In costume means to bite. And so they would scrape the, the ink and then they would rewrite over it. You couldn't see it with the naked eye, but you can x-ray it. And they've been able to x-ray older manuscripts on um, underneath because the oak gall ink, the acidic nature of the ink bit into the skin and made that still legible. Um, and so that's a really fascinating part of this very, very long history of oak gall ink. And I've sort of been a little bit, done a number of projects around oak gall ink because of the, its history in, um, in writing, the recording of history, right? The, the recording of culture. Um, so oak gall has played a really important role. So this was a project where I invited, uh, got this grant, I invited 10 artists to join me because I'm always interested in working with artists and doing interesting creative things. We gathered, we foraged, we, we collected, we did a bunch of stuff. And in my studio, we made ink from all of the different oak galls um, that we had um, collected. And then we did collaborative drawings. And this is just an image of <laughs> lots of ink being made. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful ink, absolutely wonderful to work with. And um, that culminated in an exhibition of collaborative drawings that were all made using the ink. And we passed drawings around in small groups and people worked on one another's drawings and, and um, ended up in being this really beautiful exhibition, which was at MapSpace. Um, so again, an opportunity to, to do really creative things and interesting things in the space. Um, so I thought well, just to kind of begin to, to wrap up, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about process. I've talked a little bit about the process. So here you see some cochineal. These are the bugs here and here, and this is the dye that's being made. Cochineal makes um, anything from a, you know, the British red coats are dyed with cochineal. So it can make this very orangey crimsony red to a deep purple. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful um, dye material. I work with lots of different um, dyes and, and materials. So this here we have minerals, we have, these are all red clays and yellow clays and green clay, which is the first pigments that were used by human beings. The caves of Lascaux 30, 40,000 years ago were done with clay and soot, right? So clay is one of the, it still is even today, one of the primary color sources um, used. Um, this is rose matter, which is the root. This is Brazil wood, which is a tree that actually the Spanish named the country after. Um, and so, and these are dyed with, this is indigo or woad. These are done with, um, let's see, that's, these are um, buckthorn berries. And so uh, on and on. These are again, materials that are used, were used in, historically in art materials, in paintings and books, and, um, and these are just some images. This is Brazil wood, dying with Brazil wood. This is cochineal, the purple and the, this is all cochineal, this is cochineal. This is turmeric, um, which is not used so much in, in um, paintings and stuff because it's very fugitive, it fades very quickly, but it is beautiful on, on textile. Um, so this is, these are, and this is another you know, way my studio, this is actually a workshop I did, but um, you'll see materials laid out and lots of different, um, and again, interested in the ways that the materials bring their own stories with them, their aesthetic story and their historical story. Um, and so this is a cornflowers, uh, which is would have been used in books, but not in paintings and um, crushing up of malachite. And this is over here, you can see some lapis and malachite. This is the grinding of the malachite to make a color. And these here are Native American paint pots um, that they would store the iron oxide in. Um, and finally, to end, I'm just going to show you this very, very short, <laughs> because even though you can see lots of pictures of the dye, it really it is, you know, much more fun to see it actually happening. This is when I was dyeing some of the lace the with the cochineal. I make these large vats of cochineal. Again, the the lace will be dyed and then dried, dyed and dried, dyed and dried multiple times to get the color 
that I really want and to also get that, build up that kind of residue on the surface of the, um, of the lace. And, um, and that's it, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm gonna stop share and, whoop, oh, I lost you, wait. There we go. <laughs> so I... a very, very quick overview of, of um, you know, a few projects. And um, someone says, I, mean, I have worked with Indigo quite a bit. I didn't show any Indigo, I, could, I probably I could have done a whole section on, you know, I've done in, whole Indigo projects on whole projects with Oak Gall and projects with Cochineal. So, yeah. I, so, I've got to say that was a beautiful in-depth presentation. And what strikes me is how an artist goes down a path and goes really deeply. And, you know, we benefit from that for you, it's like secondhand. This is the, the path you've chosen, but it is quite unique. And for me as an artist, I, it adds to my tools, it adds to my knowledge. And I think for everybody here, you've sort of expanded us in a way. Um, and it's because of your, your sort of linear focus. Um, and again, line coming into play. Uh, I wanna read a couple of comments and then open it up to any thoughts. Um, Beth Darry says, wonderful and insightful talk, Patricia and Christopher. Gloria Sampson Knight, thank you, that was wonderful. Um, Eloisa Pomfret, thank you for the wonderful event. Um, and Peg Riley pointed out that when you wrap the trees in red, you're, you're at a polar opposite, the red and green opposite each other. Um, on the color wheel, wheel being complementary colors. And that's, it adds to the strength of what you did. Um, I wanna open it up to questions and thoughts and then I'll just wrap it up. But anybody who'd like, you know the rule of thumb here, this is good yelling and screaming. That's the way you sort of speak. So just jump in if you have anything you'd like to say. I know it, but you're, I understand if everyone is tired, this is a long, long talk. But if you're interested in natural dyes and pigments, I mean, you know, contact me or collaborations. I'm always wanting to talk to people. But. Very nice, um, very nice. I do want to close with one point. Um, Om Omar mentions you really uh, piqued my interest in natural dyes. I would really like to have links to processes. Um, Omar does work with textiles and materials. Uh, Jenna Lash points out the juxtaposition of Patricia and Christopher's work creates a fascinating intersection. It shows two people's deep connection to their work and to each other. Um, Peg, Peggy Pugh asks, is your selection of color, is it for a specific reason? Yeah, I mean, you know, there there are these there are all these layers to the choices, right? There is the aesthetic. I mean, the red is very beautiful, and especially when I was working on these projects with the lace and thinking about textile as something that's close to our bodies, I was thinking about the kind of bodily um, relationship of the red, right? The way the the relationship of red to the body. It's a very bodily color, and so that was important to me. That kind of visceral body, and the fact that it's a natural, it's an insect. Like there's all these kinds of layers of like earthiness. So the red was really important, um, and the red clay in the hanging piece. You know, again, that red clay having this incredible history um, of of use all over the world, and to the point where you know, in in the in the Hebrew Bible, it says we were, you know, God took the red clay, right, and and made man. And I think that's. The way that these, we think that materials are kind of, I think that we often think that, I don't know if we think this, but we see the world sometimes as outside of us, right? That, that we are somehow outside of nature. And I, I feel like when I'm working with these materials, I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm, I'm sort of one with the materials in the sense that we're both kind of actors in this play, right? In this, in this, like, in this um, narrative of living, right? I'm doing my human thing and the materials are doing their thing and we are, in, in collaboration and I think that making them visible for me is also important because of you know the environmental crisis that we're in I want the kind of materials to be visible so that people can um, realize that we're not outside of nature we are all nature yeah someone wrote in there we are nature and I think that that's a, been a real problem right we think of nature as this you know, like a supermarket, we go out and we take stuff and we bring it in and all of that. And we really have to, I mean, we don't have a choice. We have to change that way of thinking. And so 
you know, for me, this a kind of intimacy that I develop with the materials is very personal, right? It, it, it's, it's not that it has to be there in the work, but in my working with these materials, I really feel palpably, right? That I am not sort of, that we're in this, this dialogue, that me and the materials are in this dialogue. I also think that we, we, we think through the material world. We are material beings. And I think that um, we often think, oh, we're all, you know, in our heads, but we, we still are human. We are still physical. We still live in the physical world. And we, we have to engage with the world in, through the physical, through the physical material. And so I think about that a lot as like in, in terms of the, in terms of the projects that I do. So the colors are related. I mean, they're also aesthetic. They're incredibly beautiful, right? These natural colors are so beautiful. Um, and they have, they have a subtlety and a complexity that's a little bit different than, than the modern synthetic dyes, which are also beautiful, but the, the earthy colors have this complexity and nuance and subtlety that I feel really drawn to. In addition to, of course, thinking about my environmental impacts and the kinds of materials that I use as an artist. Like, do I want to make more objects and what do those objects mean? And what do they, what are they made of? And what, how am I accountable to those materials? And how do I want to be accountable? I don't think that artists have to, right? I don't think you, you are by nature required to be an environmentalist. But for me, thinking about the ecological footprint of my objects became really important. <laughs> and I, so I, I think about that. I think you did yeah. a great job of sort of tying in the connectedness of you to the materials, to nature, and you're right. We often see it as us and them. It's really just one us. That connected connectivity can be hard to see. Peggy Pugh points out something that was on my mind. The red is blood, is life. That is an analogy. Uh, when colors, when cultures, all cultures recognize color, first it's black and white. The next color to be recognized is red. And I have a feeling it just comes from the fact that, you know, blood is red and Red, of course, the hottest color. So that, that certainly has an impact. Um, Alyssa, I think it's Audrey wanted. Go ahead, Audrey. Sorry, I, thought, I see Audrey raising her hand there. So, so, so I'm going to throw something out that um, uh, is is probably fodder for a whole nother discussion. But um, my my husband was listening in also, and he was pointing out the the number of hours in making the lace. And when you look at those pieces, I mean, it's pretty overwhelming. It, you know, if you if you could add up the hours from different people working, working, working. Um, but it, it's also interesting because one of the things that we want to do is we want to honor women and arts that were traditionally uh, thought of as lower crafts or something that women did. But he had a very interesting thought and he, the idea of uh, staying out of trouble because you don't have idle hands, um, you know, and so there might be like a, kind of an, a, a cultural aspect of repression, having women do these time consuming activities. And um, again, I, I know that this could be like a very broad conversation. Um, no, it's, it's but really, I just it's, to kind of throw that in the mix because I mean, you, you know, your, your cultural connection and the historical aspect and even your personal heritage. Um, you know, when you watch Italian movies, you know, like the archetypes or the stereotypes of what's manly, what's feminine, you know, th these are all interesting when we look at it through our current contemporary cultural filters and, you know. No, it's, it's I, I, I mean, I'm so glad, I'm really glad, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, 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 I'm really glad you said that because that, the idea of the labor made visible, like making these huge things um, I, I mean, when in the show that I had at Odetta, people came in and they were blown away by the labor. I mean, they, they, you know what I mean? Like stuff, it may take you an entire day to make something that's like an inch square. That's still true, right? That, and so my research, this has led me into a pretty in-depth research into lace, which I haven't, I don't have, a, I wouldn't, I didn't share tonight because I'm still in the midst of that. Um, and I think this idea of the hidden labor made visible was a, always a really important aspect for me. And the hidden labor of women in particular, not only women, right? Because there's a lot of hidden labor um, that, that got revealed in the pandemic, which was, again, I had been thinking about the labor before the pandemic. And the fact that like at this, you know, all of a sudden it became, both of those became, that the pieces became a kind of visible manifestation of this labor. Um, and that was being reflected in our living room, suddenly all facing the street where that labor became visible. And I, and I extend that to, you know, the labor of grocery store clerks or delivery people, the kinds of 
hidden labor, the precarious hidden labor that the society functions on, right? And so that is a kind of a subtext in it that I that making that um, making that uh, making that labor visible. And I think the the, the thing with lace that's I mean, there, it, it, well, there's not time to talk about it now, but the story of lace is really incredible, um, and it is primarily women in their domestic spaces making lace. Um, very labor intensive, incredibly laborious and making it for well, you know, like a wealthy person to have a lace collar. Um, and so it was an economic lifeline for many women. It was the only thing they might have had very often, um, as well as being, yeah, I mean, I think it's a very complex story. So I'm, I'm interested in that complex story and the way that complex story, the story of lace, also reflects the complexity of the things we're dealing with now in the ideas around labor and around women's labor and all of that, like that is in the work. Now you can also see the work and just say, it's very pretty, right? Like That's okay with me. I don't, you know what I mean? It's not, they're not, they're not polemic works in that way. Um, I think that it's, I mean, I'm interested in work that has layers so that if one wants to approach it, one can approach it at, and, and kind of engage and deepen the layer or engage at any point, right? At any point of that layer. But I have to say, I was really amazed at how many people who came to the show instantly got the labor, the thing about that about female labor. Like they saw it, that was like the first thing. They were like, oh my gosh, this is like, a, you know, the visibility of labor. And so that was really interesting because I didn't know, right? I don't know if that was going to be, was important to me. Um, and I, of course, I want the pieces to be interesting to look at, you know, aesthetically interesting. And you don't always know if people are going to see all the things and they don't have to, right? They don't have to. Um, but I, I think people I, got it. I will say, I like the way you, you, you express the range of ideas, both the materials, which are very physical and the social context of the materials you're using. I applaud you for that. Um, I want to read one more comment. I think it summarizes um, what we're all feeling. Basha Ruth Nelson, your work touched me deeply. I think that's one of the nicest things somebody can say to an artist. There are a lot of other great comments. I do want to wrap it up. I want to add one thought. Um, uh, Christopher's work with line, I often think, you know, if you mapped out the path that you travel in your day, in your week, in a month, you'd find that the path, whether it's circular, it is very, very repetitive. And there are a couple of ways to look at that. One is, you know, the Buddha sat underneath a tree and he became still. And through stillness, he experienced everything and nothing. On the other hand, the importance, if you notice, both the artists today they're New Yorkers, but their experiences have them travel around the globe. And there's certainly some advantage to getting out of the circle and the little spiral you travel to go elsewhere to appreciate the thing that you see every day. And I think my last thought will be, well, that's if you apply line to your physical travels. What if you mapped out your mind and the thoughts that you go through. I think you'd find we all go through the same thoughts, whether it's time to eat, go to work, how are my kids? Oh, that person did that to me. Oh, I'm gonna do that tomorrow. And then we reiterate and reiterate. And maybe it's best if somehow we break out of the loops that we have created and it sort of helps us become a little more enlightened. Um, we can become very repetitive. So it, maybe art, is trying to awaken us and to enlighten us to new physical paths and certainly to new mental paths of possibilities. Both you artists did that. You expanded, I think, all of us here in a very beautiful way. We are Artists Talk on Art. We meet every Monday. Um, this was a great presentation. Spread the word, tell your friends, become a part of our group, our tribe, our hive. So nice to see so many familiar faces. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Great Thank friend. you. In, in touch. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. And Thank, you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for all the great comments, too. Thank you. Great discussions. So nice to hear. You're done? Yeah.